I know. Oh, I'm that. a bad Buddhist. <laughs> no. Oh, good to see you. Uh, well, good I to am. see you. Good to see everyone. Oh, let me do this. Mute. Okay. <laughs> Juggling technology here. One moment. Okay. Tonight's speaker is Andrew Way. I hope I pronounced that close. Currently You're works. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Currently works at the Bowan Shan Institute of Humanistic Buddhism, where he is translating the Bowan Shan. Dictionary of Buddhism to make the wisdom of the Buddha more accessible to the world. And tonight he is going to speak to us about meditation and how it focuses our attention on the present moment. And down on the surface, it may seem like odds with uh, pure land Buddhism, but He's going to tell us how these two practices have been practiced together for centuries and are mutually beneficial. And from there, I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. Oh. Thank you. And we'll believe meditation. I'm yes. sorry. I, I was going to pass it. You can pass it to me, and I'll just pass it back to the <laughs> Bomi to lead the meditation. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Andrew, for making time to share with us this lecture. So I know every one of us are rushing from somewhere else, doing something else. So let us give ourselves a moment to ground ourselves and uh, gather our thoughts. If you have glasses, please remove them. Make sure that we are sitting upright, both be flat on the floor. If we feel comfortable with our eyes fully closed, let us close our eyes. If not, we can gently look downward 45 degrees in front of us. That is us uh, taking a few deep breaths as we gather our thoughts, our mind, onto our breathing. Fully aware of each breath that we take. in and out through our nostrils.
Yeah, let's go ahead and take in a few deep breaths. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in again, breathing out. As gently wrap our palms together. Gently cover our palms on our eyes, the top of our head, over our ears, to the back of our neck. Let's rub our palms together again. Massage our shoulders, arms, all the way to our fingers and wrists. Okay. So you may put back your glasses if you have one. And now, uh, without further ado, let us uh, welcome Andrew to share with us uh, his talk for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Grandpa Miao-Tang. So thank you to everybody here, um, all of you online and also all of you at Shifang Temple. It's been a while since I've done one of these with you. I don't know if you all remember the last time I was on this, but uh, we talked about uh, the order of a Buddhist service. And so hopefully that gave a little bit more context into the weekly services that you would see at really any Fogongshan branch temple in the world. Um, today, we're going to take a little bit of a step back and sort of more into the conceptual side of things. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the underlying theories and goals of what um, this practice is trying to do. And for a really long time, I was debating back and forth as to how technical this should be. Um, but I decided to keep it sort of accessible to um, a general audience. And of course, um, later on in uh, the Q&A session, if people want to get more technical, I'm, I'm happy to answer that to the best of my ability. Um, but also a disclaimer, uh, I'm just here sharing. This is not a formal class. I don't think I'm necessarily qualified to teach a formal class in that way. I'm just sharing what I've um, been reading and studying. And um, if you have further questions, I mean, you have a wonderful venerable there in San Diego who would be able to help you as well. So um, please make use of all of your resources, especially in-person resources now that we're out of the pandemic. All right, um, with that, I'm going to go straight into my PowerPoint. So my topic tonight is called Single-Minded and Undistracted. And I'm going to move this tab out. One moment. Here we go. All right. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is we're discussing Pure Lands. So of course, we're going to talk about Pure Lands. I wanted you to take a look first at what a pure land looks like. And so this is a very traditional depiction of a pure land, right? Um, and so in this traditional depiction, you have the Buddha. Um, his hands are in the teaching mudra. And so he's always preaching the Dharma and the pure land. So the pure land from this, just from the art visually, we can see that the pure land is the place to learn the Dharma. The Buddha is preaching uh, and surrounding him are all of these bodhisattvas who are studying uh, as you go further and further down the painting, the bodhisattvas get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, those are the newer bodhisattvas. And so they come in and then they learn. And then as they learn, at least in the picture, they, they start to grow. And so the bigger bodhisattvas have matured on the path. And that's how they show it in, in Buddhist art. But it's not just the Buddha who's preaching. Um, so these are the ones being reborn. And then the other thing I wanted to show is that if you look around, there are a lot of things going on. You have lots of trees, you have lots of bushes, you have lots of buildings. And one of the main points in Pureland texts is that aside from the Buddha preaching, like actually giving a teaching, the entire atmosphere, the entire environment is teaching you the Dharma. And so when the wind blows, it's making everyone who hears it mindful of the Buddha, mindful of the Dharma, and mindful of the Sangha. And so these are very early ways of um, 
meditation. These are uh, what's called Buddhanusmirti. So mindfulness or recollection of the Buddha, bringing the Buddha's virtues to mind, bringing the Dharma's qualities to mind, bringing the Sangha's qualities to mind. These are the objects of meditation in the Pure Land. Um, and so it's not just that. It talks about how when the wind rustles through the trees, uh, it makes all of the people who listen to that be able to think about and learn um, the Eightfold Path and other concepts. And so every moment in the Pure Land is imbued with this um, sense of learning and sense of uh, Dharma. And so keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to be circling that topic a lot today. So just keep that in your mind. Everything in the Pure Land is there to help you progress on the Buddhist path. Everything in the Pure Land is there to help you learn the Dharma. So where do we get this idea of Pure Land? And so if you've been to Shilai Temple, just a couple hours from um, Shifang Temple, from all of you in San Diego, you'll see that this Buddha is very familiar. This is the main Buddha in Shilai Temple, um, in the main shrine. And so he sits there, he's Shakyamuni Buddha. And so in the earliest, earliest, earliest text of Buddhism, uh, we focus on the historical Buddha. And so the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, this is the one that everyone learns about in their middle school textbooks, right? The prince who grew up in India and left the palace, uh, went through six years of asceticism, attained enlightenment, and then uh, went on to teach for the rest of his career. So this is the Buddha and he lives in a world. So we can call this a pure land, right? Um, a pure land is a place where you can learn the Dharma and where the Buddha is present. So we go from a single Buddha in the single land. If everybody in Buddhism will agree on this, there's a Buddha in a single land, we are there. And then we think about how this can be expanded because we see this concept a lot. All sentient beings can become Buddhas. So if all sentient beings can become Buddhas, then what does that mean for the number of Buddha lands? So you think about, this is just one busy street. So you think about this picture, all of these people, which I cannot count how many people there are in this picture. And you think that all of these people have the potential to become Buddhas and not just potential as in they might become Buddhas, but potential as in they will become Buddhas. So each of these people will become Buddhas and each of these Buddhas will have their own lands. And that means you, me, all of us, all of our friends, all of our families, all of our pets, all of the people we don't really like in this world will become Buddhas and they will have their own lands. Now, when we think about it that way, it's not just one single Buddha in one single land, it's infinite Buddhas in infinite lands. And so in the history of Buddhist texts, we start to see that this genre comes out where it's not just talking about this present realm, um, the Saha world and Shakyamuni Buddha. It talks about lots of other Buddhas in other directions. And so the most popular of these that we talk about today is Amitabha Buddha. And so if you're at Shifang Temple, you'll know that the central image um, in your temple is Amitabha Buddha. And he's standing. Now, that's not the only Buddha who is popular in terms of Pure Land practices uh, in history. And so the earliest ones, uh, we're talking about Akshobhya Buddha. And so this is the Buddha of the East. Not very popular today. Not very many people have heard this name. Other Buddhas um, include uh, Maitreya. That's a more popular one that people might have heard of. Um, he's the future Buddha. But there are a lot of, a lot, just plenty and plenty and plenty of sutras on different Buddhas, different Pure Lands, how they got to the stage of being a Buddha and how they created their pure lands. So the emphasis in a lot of these earlier texts isn't so much, well, how do we get reborn in a pure land? Nowadays, I think there's a lot of emphasis on this more passive aspect of how, how do I get reborn in a pure land? But in these early texts, they talk about how people build pure lands. How does a Buddha create a pure land? And the point of that is, is that it's giving us a model, it's giving us guidelines for us to learn how we can build our own pure lands. So the entire idea of this is that we're not passively visiting a pure land. That's a great thing. I mean, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's very popular, people do it, it's very accessible. But 
especially in humanistic Buddhism, I think, we have to sort of put ourselves to um, higher expectations and go beyond just being reborn somewhere and taking part in something, but rather creating something new to help others. Um, and that's really in line with the Bodhisattva spirit. One really accessible text, I think, is the Vimalakirti Sutra. And so this is one where uh, you can find many, many translations in English. We have it preserved in Tibetan. We have it preserved in Chinese. We have it preserved in Sanskrit. It's a very fun text to do research on. It's a very fun text to just read. Um, and one quote that I really like from it is this one. So if bodhisattvas wish to obtain a pure land, they should purify their own minds. Following the purification of their minds, the Buddha lands will also be purified. What this is saying is that if we want to have a pure land, then we have to purify our minds. So this is where, again, the relationship between pure lands and meditation starts to come into play. This won't be a very technical talk, but I want to give this idea that the, pure, the stages of purifying the mind are correlated with the purification of the land. And so I put it in Chinese, if you know how to read Chinese, I put it in Sanskrit, if you're interested in reading Sanskrit. But I also wanted to show you that Sanskrit is not, Sanskrit can be a very scary language, but for people who don't know Sanskrit and you only operate in English, just from Buddhist exposure, you can sort of figure out what it's trying to say. The grammar might be difficult. So for example, we have yadarshi, bodhisattvasya, citta parishuddhi, uh, and then Buddha Kshetra Parishuddhi Sambhavati. So that sounds like a lot of gibberish, maybe. Uh, you don't need to know the grammar as much. I'll explain the grammar. But what is one word that you can identify? The first word you should be able to identify is Bodhisattva, because that word has entered the English language. So if a Bodhisattva, so the Yatad is just if then. So if a Bodhisattva's Chitta, what, where do we know the word chitta? Maybe bodhicitta, um, chitta means mind. So if the bodhisattva's mind, parishuddhi, pure, I'll just give you that one. That one's not really easy to know. Tadarshi, then buddha kshetra, we can recognize the word buddha, right? So buddha kshetra, buddha, land, the, the buddha's land is purified. So here it just says, it's a very simple then statement. If the buddha, if the bodhisattva's mind is pure, then as a buddha, the land will be pure as well. So we think about that and we think about how we can purify our minds so that we can purify our lands. If you were here at the talk I gave for I Think Buddha, it's Friday, what, maybe one or two years ago now, Venerable Miao Zhang gave a very good concluding statement, which was that ultimately what we're doing here is refraining from all evils, cultivating all virtues, and purifying the mind. These are the, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. Um, and so not just this particular Buddha uh, in our current world and time, but the past seven Buddhas all said the same thing. So the core teaching of Buddhism as summarized in this verse is that, you know, don't do things that are hurtful to people, do things that benefit people. And basis for both of these are purifying the mind. And so purifying the mind, is the way that we advance on the spiritual path. We'll get into how this works later. Something else though, is that when the Buddha attained awakening, at least in the Chinese tradition, we have this quote from him where he says, marvelous, marvelous, all sentient beings inherently possess the Tathagata's wisdom and characteristics of virtue. However, due to deluded thoughts and attachments, they are unable to realize it. So the idea with this statement is that enlightenment or awakening isn't something that we are necessarily reaching towards, that we're, we're not there yet, and so we have to get there. It's always there. The issue is, is that it's covered up by other things. So this is why the idea of purification is so important um, in Buddhism. So if I were to say that, you know, your goal is to have um, a clean piece of clothing. You want a clean shirt. If there is no shirt there, it would take you a very, very, very long time to get the materials and to sew your own shirt from scratch. But 
if you have the shirt there already, it's just covered in mud and grime and soot, and it doesn't even look like a shirt anymore, you might not recognize that there's a shirt underneath all of that dirt. But once you wash away the dirt, you realize, oh, you know, I put it through the wash a few times, I scrubbed it, scrubbed it really hard, I let it dry, maybe it's not clean enough, I'll scrub it again. And then eventually you will get to that shirt. It just takes a long, it takes a while. But if there was no shirt there to begin with and you were just pushing mud around, no matter how much mud you push around, you're not going to get to a shirt. So that's the dirty clothing, dirty laundry kind of analogy. But for here, it's saying that Buddha nature is the shirt, you know, the enlightenment or the awakening is there. We all have a shirt. It's just really, really dirty. So we have to do our best to wash it. And once we wash it, we'll realize that, oh, the shirt was here the entire time. Um, and so you can think of this in different kinds of analogies too. Uh, in Buddhist texts, we love the analogy of refining gold. And so when you look at a rock, you look at it and say, ah, it's just a rock but there's gold ore in it. And so you just have to break it up into chunks. You have to refine it. You have to melt it down, purify it, melt it down, purify it. And then through that process of refining, that worthless piece of rock, you realize it's gold. The gold, the gold didn't come out of nowhere. The gold was always in that rock the entire time. We just didn't know it. We didn't recognize it. And so all of us have that kind of gold ore within us. It just takes a lot of refining and effort to, to bring it out. If the gold was not there in the first place, it doesn't matter how many times you you heat up a rock. It's not it's not going to magically turn into gold. Um, we're not alchemists here, but we are refinists. We are refining ourselves to um, purify what is uh, already there. Right. Another question I have for you all, though, is how do we see the pure land? Of course, how can we see something like this? We're not there. We're not in the land of ultimate bliss. We're not in Sukhavati. Um, we're here. What do we see in our daily lives? We might not even be able to go to the temple very often. Mm, where do we spend most of our time? And can we see the pure land in the places that we frequent? So think about that for a moment. Where do you spend most of your time in your day-to-day -day life? So if you spend your lot of your time in a cafe, then maybe the cafe can be your pure land and you can practice compassion and wisdom there. You can purify your mind in the pure land in the pure land that is the cafe. So um, you can be a cafe pure land, right? Or if you're in the office for most of the day, then it can be your office pure land. And of course, this is kind of a generalization of what a pure land is but if we're able to see the scenarios that we encounter in each of these places as scenarios that teach us the dharma then in a way it is functioning very similar to a pure land at least in our own context and so if we're able to take every lesson that we have if we're able to for example as you're making coffee or as you're receiving coffee in the uh, cafe if you're able to notice the impermanence of the coffee, that the temperature goes from hot to cold very quickly, that your satisfaction of it changes with every sip, you're learning the Dharma as you're drinking a cup of coffee. If you're able to work together with others on a team project, and you're able to notice the times when your emotions start to flare up, your temper starts to get a little bit uncontrollable, and you're able to bring it back down, well, you learn something. You practice Buddhism, practice the Dharma. And that environment, even though it doesn't look like a pure land, has taught you something. And in that sense, helped you become um, more capable and it helped you progress in, in the Buddhist path. And so in that sense, it's operating as a pure land. Something we have to keep in mind though, is that what we should be doing is also expanding our pure land. So how do we purify our pure land and how do we expand it? How do we make our pure land more welcoming? How do we make it more accepting and how do we make it more helpful? So the picture on the right um, is very interesting. So we have uh, Fo Guangshan as a soccer team in Brazil. 
called the Sons of Zulai. So they are affiliated with Zulai Temple there in Brazil, and so that's where they get their name. And the idea behind it was very much expanding the Pure Land at the temple, because when one of our abbesses there um, was teaching and spreading the Dharma, um, she was mugged. And so pointed a gun at her and she promised the person mugging her that, you know, she said, I'm not able to help you, but at least I can help your kids. And so with that, she decided to create a program for the kids in the neighborhood where they could play soccer and they would get a lot of confidence. They would be able to grow and nurture team, uh, teamwork, friendship in a very positive environment. And so it created what is kind of a pure land for those kids. Um, it's a soccer pure land for them. And so in that soccer pure land, they're able to learn the Dharma, they're able to practice Buddhism without necessarily explicitly practicing Buddhism or learning the Dharma. They're just playing soccer, but through soccer, they're able to learn these things. And so I think this is a very wonderful example of how we can establish a pure land and how we can make it accepting and make it helpful to the people around us. And so you can take a minute now or maybe after the talk as well to think about the ways in which we interact with others and how our interactions with others can generate these kinds of pure lands, even if they're very brief, minute, momentary, small scale pure lands. How do we slowly start to expand that? Now we'll shift a little bit into meditation. Again, it's not going to be a very technical talk on meditation, but there's another quote from the Vimalakirti Sutra, which is Shariputra. So Shariputra is one of the main disciples of the Buddha. Shariputra thought, if the purity of the pure land depends on the purity of the Bodhisattva's mind, then why is the pure land of Shakyamuni Buddha full of suffering? This is a great question, right? We're all kind of thinking this, you know, if the pure land is supposed to be pure, since the Bodhisattva's mind was pure, then since this land isn't pure, does that mean that when Shakyamuni Buddha was a Bodhisattva, he wasn't really doing his job very well, he wasn't working very hard, and that's why this world is full of suffering? So the Buddha answers him and says, no, it's because of sentient beings' transgressions that they don't see the purity of the land. And for a long time, I thought about this. Um, a lot of times we're clouded and we don't see reality as it is. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, when you see this water, you might think to yourself, ah, refreshing. You might think to yourself, I would like to have a drink of it right now. Or you might use it to water your plants. But that's from our conditioned perspective. If I ask a fish, what do you see? It wouldn't say, ah, refreshing. It would say, ah, home. <laughs> um, it would not see our buildings as a home. It would, that would be a completely different world to a goldfish. But to a goldfish, a bowl of water is home. And to us, a bowl of water is something we can drink. Uh, probably not with the goldfish in it. But if you just see this bowl of water, you would say, oh, we're refreshing. I would like to drink that. Give it to goldfish. Not, not that it's not refreshing, but it serves a different purpose, it's home. So can we change our perspective and how we see the world around us? Are we able to see the world as a pure land um, and purify our minds to the state where we're able to see everything as it is as a pure land? So I'm going to show you a video actually on this concept called sympathetic resonance. And so in Chinese, this is called gan yin. Um, and it's a very old analogy in Chinese Buddhism, and it, it goes back at least to probably the fourth century. So what are we looking at? 1600, 1700 years ago? This is a very old analogy, and I think it might even go even further. But what happens here is that you'll see that there are two tuning forks. What's going to happen is that the experimenter will hit the tuning fork on the right, and through sympathetic resonance, because these two tuning forks are tuned, to the same frequency, even though they didn't hit the tuning fork on the left, it will vibrate and you can't see the vibrations. So what you'll look at is the ball next to the tuning fork. So when you see that ball move, it's because the tuning fork on the left is vibrating. Well, let's take a look at this.
All right, hits it. And then the ball is moving, right? But the experimenter never hit that second tuning fork. All he hit was the first tuning fork. He hit the first tuning fork. And because this, the second tuning fork is on the same frequency, it's able to vibrate sympathetically. So this idea is very close to how we understand our practice. So in Buddhism, we talk a lot about being on the same channel or being on the same wavelength as the Buddhas. The Buddhas are always emitting their frequency of compassion and wisdom, always, in all directions. They just keep sending it out. We're here trying to catch that radio wave. And so if our radio wave, let's see if I can, if we um, are on the same radio wave as them, then we would become identical to them. And so right now, what we tend to do is we tend to resonate with negative things, greed, anger, and ignorance. But if we can replace that with qualities such as kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, again, this is in the dedication of merits that we always recite. These are also the four um, Brahma Viharas or the four um, limitless minds. And so these are four qualities that we can train in our mind through meditation. And so the most popular of these, of course, is meta, uh, kindness meditation. Um, so wishing your well-being on your friends and family, wishing uh, well-being on a neutral person, wishing well-being on um, someone that you have conflicts with. And so by replacing our usual thoughts of, I don't like that person, I hope they suffer, uh, that's anger, right? We don't want that. Um, if we replace it with kindness and we say, I hope that particular person has a good time, I hope that person particular person succeeds in what they are trying to do. I hope that person is content with what they have, uh, finds contentment in life and so on. If we're able to do that, if we're able to resonate with the Buddha instead of resonating with samsara, that is this kind of cyclical um, state of emotions and going from joy to anger, to sadness, to greed, to jealousy, back and forth. If we're able to resonate with the Buddha's enlightened, acceptance, tolerance, patience, things like that, then we'll be on the same wavelength as them and we'll be able to see the world through their eyes. So one other thing I wanted to show, and um, we're going to have questions, leave time for questions after this, is I'm gonna show a short clip from a musical that was produced earlier this year in February. So this is a musical entirely in English that talks about the life of Thurible Master Xing Yun. Uh, and what I find amazing about it is that there are a lot of songs that talk about Buddhism and they convey Buddhist concepts very well. And so this is, this is one example of them. After I show this, we can keep talking about Pure Lands. Right. Where is the pure land? 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 Pure land's right here in our hearts. Where there's no greed, anger, or ignorance, there will be and joy in our hearts. Conflicts will disappear. People will live in harmony. A pure land is in a pure mind. Where is the pure land? 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 The pure land's right here in our hearts. 
All right, so I'll stop it there. If you want to watch the rest of the musical, it is, there is one version on YouTube. It's called Star and Cloud, and so you can still find it online. But I wanted to recap some points in the song that we just heard. First of all, where is the pure land? The pure land is in our hearts, right? So the first thing that we need to realize is if the pure land is in our hearts and the entire point of the pure land is that it is pure, then we have to purify our minds. And that's where it goes into meditation. These are not necessarily separate paths. I think when a lot of people come to Chinese Buddhism, um, especially after reading a lot of books in, uh, especially if that's available in English, what tends to happen is that there is a concept of two different schools of Buddhism. There's meditation, Zen, and then there's Pure Land Buddhism. And this separation exists very strongly in Japan, but does not exist in China. In Chinese Buddhism and Vietnamese Buddhism, these two are merged because purifying the mind is purifying the land. So purifying the mind, that is whatever your meditative practice is, whether that's um, breathing meditation, kindness meditation, loving kindness meditation, um, or it could be reciting the Buddha's name as a form of meditation. All of these things are purifying our mind, settling the mind and helping us reach that kind of resonance with the Buddha. So this kind of resonance is very important. The picture I have for you on the right is the moon reflected in the lake. This is another very popular Buddhist metaphor. So the moon is the Buddha, which shines in all directions. It's always shining, casting a very gentle light. If the water is not still, if it's impure, that is, if it's muddy, if it's disturbed, that is, it's windy, you're not going to be able to see a clear reflection of the moon. But when the water is still and clear, that is, when your mind is still and clear, settled down through these meditative practices, it's able to clearly reflect what the Buddha is shining. And what is the Buddha shining? Compassion and wisdom. So when we still our minds, whatever your practice method may be, um, we're able to resonate with the Buddha in that sense. All right, so I'm going to leave a lot of time for questions. I hope you have lots of questions. If you don't, I will have, of course, I can talk about any other points that I've made in um, my talk today, but I do want to sort of hear from all of you because it's been a good year or two since, since we've had a nice talk together. And so I want to hear a lot from all of you to see what you feel about this and if you have any the points that you would like uh, clarifying, thank you. Yeah, uh, I see a question online. Um, Linda, are you fielding the questions or do you want me to field my questions? Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the screen here to see. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, okay, I see someone in chat. Oh, on the screen? Oh. Yeah, I think Jordan okay. has a question. Okay, Jordan, you need to unmute. Hi, can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andrew. This was a really interesting conversation um, or lecture or whatever it is that you'd like to call it. It feels like we're starting the conversational side at least. Um, I've always been a bit reluctant to even start to touch the uh, concepts of Pure Land because I see myself more resonating with like the realist materialist skeptical side of things it made me laugh when you brought up um alchemy i'm not trying to to bring the the gold out of the the rocks where the ore doesn't exist so it's it's interesting um to learn in a more metaphorical sense i think about uh about the pure land and i wanted to ask i suppose a question if um if there are different schools of thought on whether or not Pure Land is meant to be understood metaphorically, or if it's something on a more literal side and where 
that delineation sort of exists. You talked about Japan and China and um, Vietnam, for example. And then uh, I had another sort of question within that, that from the sutra that you quoted uh, regarding this being Shakyamuni Buddha's pure land, I suppose was what I understood of it, right? Um, because we are here and this is where the suffering is with the other sentient beings. So are we meant to understand that we live still sort of in the, the pure land of Shakyamuna, Shakyamuni Buddha? Uh, I have a number of other questions. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. And I'd like to say that I'm reading um, There is No Suffering, a commentary on the Heart Sutra with uh, our uh, reading group right now. And you helped really clarify a concept in uh, one of the chapters everywhere um sorry everywhere we must build places for practice which are like reflections of the moon on water um that was the the understanding that i had about it was you know where where to meditate and things of that nature where we need to practice and to think of each place as a pure land and with the information that you gave I, that's deep in my understanding so i appreciate that very much uh, thank you Thanks. I, this gives me a very good opportunity to clarify something that I didn't clarify in my talk earlier, which is that there are literal interpretations and then there are metaphorical interpretations of the Pure Land. From pretty much all of the sources I've seen, the people who take Pure Land metaphorically will not deny that there is a literal Pure Land. The difference is, is that the emphasis is on the Pure Land and the here and now. Um, it's not to say that there is no pure land elsewhere, but if it's a pure land that is elsewhere and not immediately accessible, then it's kind of distant from what we're doing in our own practice, right? Um, and so in order to make that concept of a pure land more uh, relevant to what we're doing, I think it's important to emphasize that the pure land can be found here. It can be found now. It can be found everywhere. And this is something that, at least for humanistic Buddhism, is really a core philosophy. It's the core doctrine that, you know, we are building a pure land here on earth. And by building a pure land here on earth, we don't mean literally like we're going to carve out pools and decorate them like a pure land would be in the sutras. But it means creating that kind of environment where people can practice the Dharma without obstructions, um, pre creating a safe um, and uh, accessible environment where everyone can come together and progress on um, the Buddha's path and cultivating these virtues. So I hope that answers that question. There are a lot of different interpretations of Pure Land, which is why I, I am very um, insistent that, you know, the metaphorical interpretation of a Pure Land does not it does not deny or reject the literal interpretation. It's it's an added layer. Um, and I think that added layer really helps us incorporate it into our practice in a much more dynamic way. Um, that's at least my experience with this kind of idea of Pure Land. And so when uh, you have a chance, actually, I know every year around um, December, towards the end of December, Shilai Temple, just um, a couple hours away from all of you, has a seven day Amitabha retreat. And so it's seven days of chanting Amitabha the Buddha's name. And this is very much a pure land kind of retreat. But if you haven't had a chance to participate before, I would go, even if it's just for one session or maybe for one day, maybe for a weekend, if you can take the whole seven days off of work and have a um, chance to really immerse yourself in that environment, it would be really nice too. But it's a really great opportunity to sort of personally feel how this kind of Pure Land practice um, is extremely meditative and it purifies the mind immediately in that in, in this course of that session. So um, I hope that that is helpful for you. And yeah, the the moon on the water kind of analogy is is found everywhere in Buddhism. <laughs> um, so so I'm I'm glad that was helpful to you. If anyone else has questions um, and I know if not, I think Jordan probably has other questions and that would be fine too. Okay, we have one from Leslie. How do you see Western Christian having compared to a pure land? Thank you. This is another question that I totally did not answer, but it's an important one because first off, I don't approach these things from a comparative perspective. I think comparing religions tends to lead to lots of sticky issues. 
what I will say is that Buddhists have a concept of heaven and Buddhists have a concept of pure land. Buddhist concept of heaven is that, and, and I know you're asking specifically about Christian heaven, but my Christian theology is not very good and I'm not going to try to talk about things that I don't know. So from my understanding, Buddhist heaven is not permanent. Um, and it's, so it's still subject to this cycle of transmigration. And so being reborn in heaven does not necessarily mean you are um, forever happy. You are just happy for a very, very, very long time. And then when your merits run out, when the idea of that, when, when all of your virtues end, you drop back down. The idea of a pure land is that you're not trapped in the cycle. You're not looking for something that's better and then falling back down when when you don't get that um you're leaving that entire cycle so then the thing that's keeping us sort of trapped um mostly in in the cycle of suffering is desire and so desiring pleasure is also still a form of desire um and so you might have done lots of great things you might be a very happy person but you know even happy people have bad days and again i'm using these very emotional sort of psychological or metaphorical kind of um, ways to talk about this. But I think it's a way to make our understanding of transmigration and rebirth a little bit easier. You can be a very happy person. Happiness, you can sort of equate that sort of with um, heaven. You can be a very happy person most days, but things will happen. And when things happen, you fall back down. You fall into negative emotions. You fall into greed, anger, ignorance, these things, because you're not free from them. The idea of a pure land is that you don't, the, the goal is not just being happy. Being happy is sort of a side effect of the Buddhist path. Buddhism um, teaches us to go beyond sort of wanting to fulfill our desires. It's sort of the understanding that no matter how many material things you accumulate, you will never be satisfied because this desire is still going. If you transfer that and you change it and you go from wanting the next biggest thing, if you're able, okay, so for example, if you want ice cream and you're able to get ice cream, happiness, right? If you want ice cream and you're not able to get ice cream, suffering. There will be a day when you want ice cream and you are not able to get it for whatever reason, or you get it and you drop it. Kids do this all the time. Immediate from heaven to hell, just immediate drop, right? And, and it's very visible when we see that. The idea in Buddhism is that how do you avoid that? It's to be okay with ice cream or without ice cream. And I'm saying this very intentionally because I think a lot of people will say, well, then just don't want, just reject ice cream. You just don't want ice cream at all. But then what happens when your 